Well, uh, it's almost hard to start any conversation with anybody these days without uh, COVID-19 coming up and the, the impact that it's had uh, on our world. Uh, what have, uh, wh wh how have you seen it impact uh, um, how you're practicing at, at SHUM? Well, we obviously in the hospital went into sort of lockdown mode and um, reduced all of our non-essential activities, certainly at the beginning. Um, I was actually not uh, working uh, for the first two or three weeks. Uh, so um, I was basically just sort of sitting at home uh, watching the news all the time. Uh, we brought all the kids back. I had uh, one of my daughters is University of the States. We brought her back. And we have a, a cottage up north, so we were just basically all sort of huddling in the cottage. Um, as I to say, I think it was a, it was actually kind of a unique time for us to kind of get together as a family, because uh, that doesn't happen, and and really be spending all the time together instead of yeah. all doing different stuff, you know, and uh, and having to kind of communicate a little more. So that was that was nice. Then I did start working a bit, and um, uh, I'm, I'm to be honest, you know, to me, we're very fortunate. We have a place to go. You know, in, in medicine, you kind of have a job. So I, you know, I still have some income and stuff. Um, so to me, kind of working at about 50 percent, going to work with no traffic, uh, just having a very quiet time in the hospital was actually very, very nice. It was an unexpectedly pleasant experience. Uh, but I think everybody's getting a little bit uh, tired of it. Uh, now. Yeah. And uh Obviously, you, you, you live and work in Montreal, and it's, you know, one of those great uh, world-class cities. Uh, have you seen that uh, impacted as well? I know you're, you enjoy uh, going out to the restaurants and, uh, and the shop, and particularly in the summer, it's a wonderful place uh, to, to be. Uh, how have how things uh, been impacted there? Well, I mean, I, I really find that the... The Quebecois population really listened very well. The place was shut down. I mean, when I would go to work, they said there was zero traffic. There was nobody anywhere. Uh, people really took took it seriously. Uh, so it was really very, very, very quiet. And people, you know, at the beginning, I think also we were very, everybody was very scared. And so when you would go, uh, it's weird. You kind of, at the, at the very beginning, you sort of weren't used to the social distancing, like stay staying away from people and not touching stuff. And and then pretty quickly, you could see people got into it. And when you went to do the groceries now, it was, it was sort of a scary experience. You're like, I really want to be careful. I don't touch anything. We were you know, bringing the groceries home, washing all the groceries and stuff. And uh, so pretty much everything was shut down 100% except for majorly essential services. That's it doing nothing else. Nobody really wanted to do any takeout even. So we just get the groceries, eat at home and, and do nothing else. M Montreal was one of the harder hit cities though, right? For COVID-19 cases. Well, the thing about Quebec, and I'm not sure what it was like the other provinces, but if you, what happened primarily was that um, the, the fire caught in the, in the old folks homes. Yeah. And and it was just a you know, it was just it was a mistake. People just didn't realize that um, uh, there was uh, they were understaffed, that they had people because they're understaffed who were working in uh, personnel who were working in several different old folks homes. Okay. So once they got in, they would infect the whole place and then go they change and go work somewhere else. And, you know, if honestly, if you if you remove. If you remove all the deaths and, and the disease from the old folks homes, it's about 85% of the deaths in Quebec were all in old folks homes. Wow. But if you take those out of the numbers, it was actually like there was almost no pandemic here. Really, there's a couple of hotspots in Montreal, but yep. it, it was really, the numbers looked so bad, unfortunately, because of what happened uh, in the old folks homes. Yeah, and I, I think Ontario and the Greater Toronto area uh, had a similar situation where you know a large majority of the cases did come from long-term care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think so it's now you're uh, so now you're back to back to uh, to working. What what has changed? Uh, how have things changed at the uh, at the uh, EUS unit? So um, we. Our whole endoscopy unit uh, is definitely running at the lower pace. 
Uh, we're okay. only doing what we call P1 and P2 uh, priority cases now. The hospital, uh, you know, has been trying to keep space in case they got overloaded. Uh, and there also there were some questions about the availability of PPE. So we've stopped teaching. We're not accepting any more residents in, into the procedures. We want to make them as short as possible, use as less PPE as possible. We're only doing P1s and P2s. So for regular endoscopy, that means that they're they're basically running at about 30 to 40 percent of their regular volume. So basically doing only the inpatients and then outpatients who are urgent or semi-urgent. EUS, um, if I could say, is, you know, fortunately for us, is almost all P1 and P2s because it's all cancer screening and stuff like that. So we've yeah. been running, you know, while they were running at, you know, 10, 20% initially, we were about 50%. And now that they're up to 30, 40, we're running about 80%. So, mm -hmm. so we're almost back to, to, to full volume. Uh, in a unit that's basically very, very quiet and uh, uh, and actually quite quite nice to work in. Now. Well, and you would have had uh, cases where there was higher risk of of infection from patients in the past, anyways, where you'd had procedures in place to manage that. Well, you know, the funny thing is, the hospital, certainly the endoscopy department, is is a very cold zone, so they don't let anybody in there who has anything close to symptoms, and unless you if, if you're, you know, they, you know, they divide them into cold, warm, and hot. Um, if you're classified as warm or hot based on your questionnaire or your, where you're coming from, we just don't do the procedure unless it's a life and death situation. Okay. So that means that actually we're quite protected in endoscopy. And I think you actually, in a sense, I would tell people, you probably have more exposure to virus doing your groceries than you do being in endoscopy. Okay. Okay. And... You know, for for all the elective procedures that have been accumulating during the shutdown, you know, what would the game plan be to to catch up on those, or you know, or is there is that possible? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's you know, they're saying we're going to have to catch up, but I mean, we're basically we were already had a waiting list, and now we've been working at you know, thirty percent of our regular volume for about three months. Uh, and and the thing is, I I don't. I don't see us going, certainly going back to even going back to more than 100 percent anyway, after this is all over. And then the question is, when is this going to be all over? You know, I mean, yeah. the, the hospitals are going to be very careful about um, about uh, just letting all kinds of people come in. Uh, there have been some outbreaks in a couple of hospitals in Quebec. Uh, as I say, I think the viral load in Quebec is quite low now. If you exclude the the, the long-term care facilities, so I, th I think it is still quite safe. But uh, they're being very very cautious about reopening. And then there's always the question about the PPE and stuff like that. That's making them really take their time before opening up uh, full time. So I, honestly, I, I don't know what we're going to do uh, with this overload of patients. Uh, the, the specialist association is talking about looking at even private clinics as a way to uh, catch up on the on the OR list. I mean, in endoscopy, at least, we kept functioning to a certain extent, but the ORs were almost down yeah. to zero. And that's, I mean, those are, you know, patients with proven cancers and stuff like that just waiting, I mean, just waiting for surgery. Right, right. One of the other areas um, that obviously is going to undergo a great deal of changes around training and education. Um, you know, uh, how is uh, Shum uh, adjusting for that? And also yourself, you obviously run a very busy training program for EUS uh, and attract people from all around the world um, and had a long waiting list, um, you know, I think over a year and a half. So, you know, how, how do you see things playing out there? So for the, the, the Shum itself, for the regular GI program, they basically sh stopped allowing uh, the fellows to do endoscopy. As I say, they wanted to reduce the endoscopy time as much as possible. There was a, a big question about PPE at the beginning, so they didn't want to waste any PPE. And there was, you know, there's a question issue of safety for the residents. Uh, it was a little contradictory though, because they were sending the residents into the emergency room and the COVID wards, but they wouldn't let them do endoscopy. It was a little mm -hmm. strange. Uh, and then, and then they started saying, okay, well, uh, it was that way. They just sort of get impatient, and then it, it's like people's criteria start changing. So the residents obviously wanted the scope and they started saying, well, I think we'll start letting them come in. And, you know, and I, 
I, I had to sort of ask them, you know, if this was Ebola instead of COVID, would you be starting to say, well, let's let the, the residents come back in? You know, either it's safe or it's unsafe for them. Right. And I think what's happening, though, is that people are realizing that COVID for younger people, if they get ill, is not quite so bad. So I think they're sort of mod. At the beginning, we were very scared. You know, there were mm-hmm. people saying, you know, even young people were, were getting on respirators and stuff like that. But I think now we're realizing that the young people are pretty safe. So slowly we're starting to feel like it's okay for the, the residents to come back in endoscopy. I think the PPE situation is pretty good because the, the whole hospital load of patients is going down. So we're slowly bringing it back in. As far as our program, uh, the major issue is that now they can't even get in the country. The Canadian border is closed. And then if even if the border opens, we're not sure if they're going to ask for some type of confinement for how long or some quarantine or, or their, you know, what the criteria will be to let people come into the hospital. They have to like, have a negative test or two negative tests. I, I don't know. It's still, it's still up in the air. We, we basically, since the border's closed, we haven't even, haven't even asked many more questions for now. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, there's been some talk about maybe things easing down through the summer. Uh, and then, you know, this fear of, of a second wave, uh, maybe as the fall cooler weather starts coming again. And I think they've seen some of these secondary outbreaks in, in other countries. Is, is there some preparation going on for that, that, that you're aware of? Uh, as far as the hospital, no, other than they're probably going to be very careful about filling up the hospital. But, you know, I, I, I think people, because of this, are going to keep being careful uh, which may even help with the regular flu. You know, I think people are going to stop yeah. shaking hands. They're going to, you know, so I think in the end, it, it may actually be, if, if people are as careful as they, certainly in Quebec, I think, have they been, it may actually turn out to be a, a bit of a benefit for the whole flu season uh, in general. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, so, so yourself, you've been obviously doing this for a very long time. Uh, and, uh You've had this interesting and unscheduled break now. How how do you keep energized? Uh, how do you keep a passion for for you know doing uh, these therapeutic endoscopy and and ultrasound? So um, because of the course we do, it's been this is the twentieth year. I I think for the last twenty years, um, this is the first time in twenty years that I haven't been scoping with somebody beside me, like just scoping alone. You know, wow. Um, and to be honest, I kind of like it. <laughs> so, because so, the procedures are way shorter, you get in, you just look around, you do it, and you get out. You know, so it's much more efficient. But I must say, I'm also realizing that the fellows keep me honest because if you're alone, sometimes you go too fast. And when you're with the fellows, you kind of have to repeat, go over and over, and you sort of go, oh, yeah, that, uh, it's a good thing we look at that again. You know, so, so it's kind of interesting. So, I'm, I'm, as I just said, I'm enjoying this, um, and I'm, I'm, I guess I've decided I'm going to take it as a, as the whole COVID thing, the whole situation, as a once in a lifetime, hopefully, situation where, and, and sort of enjoy the good parts while you can, but uh, get ready to go back to to the way it was. Right, right. Now, prior to COVID nineteen, you were also traveling a fair bit, uh, going to Asia, going to India, going to Europe, and speaking. Uh, tell me about how, the, um, you know, your experience here in Canada and running one of the, uh, the top programs in North America uh, can help you, uh, you know, advance the U.S. and these other markets. Well, you know, I think that uh, I'm curious to see how people, how much people want to go back to all this traveling uh, after this is over. You know, to be honest, uh, when I'm thinking about it now, it's like, wait a sec, you know, if we can do all this by by Zoom or whatever. Uh, do we really need to be there? You know, could we just set up our lab with a good camera system and and do these live broadcasts and everybody can stay home and safe and you know? So uh, I'm 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 really curious to see what's going to happen with all these uh, all these live courses. Yeah, it's a great point because I think you know COVID nineteen has forced uh, that behavior and we're seeing uh, a proliferation of some really really good events. Uh, done online. I think uh, endoscopy on air was last week uh, and was very well followed and some great cases. And I think uh, you're you're right. I think uh, this has forced people to reconsider how they're doing things. And uh, there's also some virtual conferences now 
starting to be uh, coordinated. So it's definitely, uh, I'm not so sure things will go back to normal.